Welcome back to the Quiet On Set podcast. I'm Ewan Gruff and I'm joined by Lachlan Teeley. Hello, everybody. This week, a knives out mystery, a glassed ogre. I mean, a glass onion. That's right. <laughs> the latest from the greatest Star Wars movie director of all time. Actually, I don't think we can make this joke anymore, Ewan, because no, I mean, like, I wouldn't, as no. much as we want People to show on click the off this Jedi, video. the Rise of Skywalker came out and shat on the entire trilogy as like the worst one. So you know what? No, 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 no. It's not the worst Star Wars movie director of all time. It's the, he's, he's one of the best ones. Ryan Johnson, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Ryan Johnson's latest Glass Onion a Knives Out mystery is our topic of conversation today. Probably the biggest mystery is its box office run. We'll get into that in a second. But it is about the world famous detective Benoit Blanc, who heads off to Greece onto a private island uh, invited by a, a billionaire to um, partake in his play of mysteries, a uh, murder mystery. So that's what we'll get into. This movie has been received pretty positively so far, uh, much like the original. It is much beloved with uh, a wide crowd. I mean, the original was a smash hit. I think it made like somewhere uh, north of $700 million at the box office. So great success. Then Netflix acquired it for a staggering $350 million or $400 million, if I'm not mistaken. I'll correct myself in the edit if I uh, I'm not uh, right on there. But yeah, 3.8 on Letterboxd, a 7.4 on uh, IMDb and a 81 on Metacritic. That's a really good rating for uh, the film overall. It comes in at a runtime of 139 minutes and is, uh, like I just mentioned before, directed by the one and only Ryan Johnson, who stays out of uh, <laughs> any sort of a drama, right? At all times. He never gets involved with those. He never gets involved with established IPs. That's his big thing <laughs> yeah. now. <laughs> well, unless he creates them himself. Hey, he Ryan, we want you to direct uh, this latest Marvel. Nope. Hey, Ryan, we'd like you to direct this latest Star Ch uh, Nope. Nope. No, no, no. I've done that before. <laughs> I've done one Star movie. I'm never doing another Star movie ever again. He might stay out of the whole sci-fi genre for the rest of his entire career, which, you know, is unfortunate. Because yeah. I enjoyed Looper. I really did. I mm. thought Looper was fun. I know you didn't. You don't You don't like Looper that much, Ewan. <laughs> hey, you know that? Yeah. I haven't seen it in a long time. Maybe I should revisit it. Anyways, we got a star-filled cast with, uh, apart Huge from Daniel cast. Craig, we got Edward Norton, Janelle Monet, Catherine Hahn, Leslie Odom Jr., Kate Hudson, Dave Bautista, and many more, actually, a bunch of uh, cameos as well that are quite fun. We'll get into those once we get to talking about spoilers. But Lachlan, before we do that, uh, let's chat about the film a bit more generally, and uh, we'll get into the Netflix decisions that uh, left me quite perplexed when it comes to the theater run, but what did you make of Glass Onion overall? My God, did I have a fun time. Funnily enough, Ewan, really funny thing, I forgot we were covering it this week and I saw it came out mm -hmm. on Netflix. So I just coincidentally yeah. was like, oh, I'll give it a watch. And then after watching it, remembered, oh, that's what we're covering this week on the Quiet On Set <laughs> podcast. This, <laughs> right. uh, this uh, really shocked me because I wasn't the biggest fan of the original Knives Out, mainly due to the fact mm -hmm. that because it was a whodunit, I just didn't like how halfway through, and spoilers alert, I'm not really going to spoil too much of Knives Out, but they kind of tell you who done it. And then for the last half of the film, it's just yeah. them trying to be how smart this uh, murder mystery was. As much as I as much as much I did enjoy Knives Out, that kind of threw me off because I wanted a who done it. So going into this, I was just expecting more of the same, but in a whole different you know, sort of uh, location. I was wrong because the, the whole who done it part was kind of going throughout the entire film and there yeah. is obviously sort of a, a big reveal halfway through similar to knives out which made me yeah. go okay this is going to be a lot of fun and even before that moment where they kind of reveal why uh blunk is already or is, is at the island uh mm -hmm. there is just all of these extra little fun little cameos and funny little quips and stupid little name drops. Uh, there is just so much fun in this film. And you can feel that from Ryan Johnson's direction all the way down mm -hmm. to, you know, Daniel Craig's acting. Uh, I'm pretty sure yeah. I read an article that uh, Dave Bautista stated that Daniel Craig was having way more fun on this than he did on the uh, recent Bond films, which totally makes sense because this is a way yeah. more fun script than any of the Bond films. It's such a different tonal script, but also mm -hmm. he is just, you can just see he's enjoying himself and it's going throughout all of the cast as well. 
They're all over the top. They're all these really stereotypical characters and it was just a fun yeah. ride. I, I can't like say that I didn't enjoy this film like I did Knives Out because even mm-hmm. though Knives Out was still a good film, I just didn't like the fact that it revealed it halfway through and then the story kind of falls off. This had me from start all the way to the end. I, I feel like Knives Out does something where it, it feels like it reveals it. Maybe I am remembering it wrong, but where it reveals it, but then you get more breadcrumbs uh, until yeah. you get like the it, it whole kind of mystery unfolded. The, yeah, it kind of reveals the whole twist, but you don't get the whole yeah. picture and then it feeds it to you throughout the last sort of act of the film. and. The whole point of the who done it is that who actually done it. That's the point. And you yeah. really kind of go, oh, okay, I kind of know the twist now. And you're just following the story, which has no end. You know the end, but you know, everyone's got a part to play. It's kind yeah. of the same with this, but because this is a lot more fun for some reason, uh, and I find the comedy in this a, a whole lot better. I was enjoying yeah. this film a lot more. And it makes me excited. If, if, if they're going to be doing multiple films, which they, they are going to be doing multiple yeah, there's another one. films, uh, yeah. I want more of this. This was fun. I, it's kind of like this year for me is kind of been the year where you go back to the cinema and you watch a movie just for the fun of it. Top Gun, mm-hmm. Avatar. Even I would say The Northman was very similar to that, even though it's probably one of the only ones that's not a big blockbuster. I really enjoyed my experience. I, I, you know what? Even the same with um, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Like These are movies yeah. you go to the cinema for and you enjoy. It's the same with mm-hmm. this one here. And I'm for- Unfortunately, I missed the cinema run. It was literally one week, yeah. and I was just too busy to go and see it. I would have loved to have seen this in cinemas, but you know, I'm still going to flex my Dolby Atmos, Dolby Vision setup that I've got here next to me i had a great time (laughs) watching it at home and honestly i feel like it's a really fun movie that you could get a whole group of friends or family to watch and everyone's going to have a great time yeah yeah it's it's a bit of a pity Uh, so let's uh, get to talking about that decision from netflix it extends to some other films as well uh that didn't get the same treatment because netflix uh treated um glass Onion the harshest i feel like yeah because it was well some of them just never got a uh run but Doing it just for one week is like, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to recoup some money, making mm. it at the box office? Which would be smart because it was such a huge investment. And there's not going to be a return on subscribers from uh, this film. I-, I don't feel like, even though they are, uh, I think, just recently cracking down more, like, actually now on password sharing. I, I haven't felt any, but I'm not really sharing my passwords. Netflix, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. So, <laughs> so not, not that they would affect me, uh, but, but it's just uh, dumb. It's just plain up dumb because uh, maybe they thought less people would end up signing up and uh, you know more money in the long run if you keep it exclusive. I don't think it works that way. They are so set on being um, the winner of the streaming wars, which I guess you have to focus on because they don't have the endless funds that maybe an Apple, Apple TV Plus, or Amazon has. Uh, even Disney is not even completely safe in this. They're just unique enough with the child friend, uh, like the yeah, the family focused stuff that they have a place to stay. Any other streaming service is probably gonna go away in the next five years, sooner or later. And and Netflix is like in a unique position where they've overspent so much on productions and not you know being in the tech bubble that's bursting. Uh, like economically at the moment, and it's like, well, is the if you, if you don't keep growing, can you justify spending more and more each quarter? And I just think it was it was a misstep. And I saw it in theaters, but like when I already already told this on the show before, but I had to travel a total of I think um, five hours to well because also my train was delayed because I had to. I live in Switzerland. For those of you who don't know, near the Zurich area, I'm not getting more specific than that. And I had to go to what street uh, you on? <laughs> uh, ask your mum. <laughs> <laughs> She's in a fucking Australia. <laughs> oh my god, I can't, I can't keep it in. But now I'm, I'm like, I need to, I need to get the blood yeah, out. It rushed to my face. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that was that was good one. I'll give you that one. <laughs> anyways, uh, I had to to go to a town called uh, Freiba- Freiburg am Breisgau, which. Uh, weird little town name, uh, went to a little theater there, went with a film critic friend, and that was a fun experience. But I was like, should it be this, this hard? Should I travel so, so long just to see this film? And 
Um, I enjoyed it, uh, but overall, I feel like I enjoyed the original more. But to me, they're kind of on the same level when it comes to like quality and uh, all of that. But um, I don't know. Do you have anything else to to add? I guess to the Netflix situation, of how I mean, they handled this film. If you look at Box Office Mojo, which is how I will kind of track uh, throughout any time we quote a you know a, 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 a domestic or international release of a film, how much they've made. They have gotten down. On the 23rd of November, 2022, they've only got the domestic opening and it made 13 million. 13 million. Yikes. That's all it made domestically. But the thing is, I think it was only out for like a week there as well. So you had yeah. one week yeah, opening was, yeah. 13 million domestically. They could have easily made back their money if they had a wider release for longer in cinemas. They could have easily made back their money. So I know that Netflix's thing is obviously to be the one that you have the catalog at home and you can go watch it. And they need, they obviously need to have their originals. What I think Netflix yeah. needs to do is get out of the hole where a streaming company and that's pretty much it. And they need to go hard yeah. into the production stuff and like a traditional production house release as well. Have it in cinemas. Yeah. People want to see that. You'll make your money back. And then once you're done, put it on your streaming service. That's what Disney's doing for the majority of their films. They still release it in cinemas because that's where they want it to be seen and they're going to put it yeah. on Disney Plus later. I don't know when Avatar 2 is going to be on Disney Plus, but it's not going to be for that, a heck I was of about a long to bring time. that up. It's not going to yeah, be for a it, heck of a long time. Exactly. I feel like the window has shortened when it comes to VOD releases to streaming releases as well. Yeah. But you can still arbitrarily um, do that as long as you want to, specifically yeah. for a film. You could also, you know, just adjust it. Uh, I mean, but they are set to have, I guess, a premiere date for a film on Netflix. And I guess it goes, that comes first. And then the theater run is a, like a, a tag on, a second part to go with it. And how they've usually handled it is about two weeks before they put it into theaters, have a two-week run, and then it goes, uh, like maybe even stays in theaters while it's on Netflix, which I also think is a great decision. For people who maybe start the film on Netflix and mm. they're like, they already got the service. I'm like, hold on. I want to experience this on the biggest stream, screen possible because I'm only watching it on my iPod. Uh, and like, you know, why not give the people uh, options? That's what so, streaming is all about. You're giving them question, options. My next question for you, Ewan, is you work, you yeah. work at a cinema. So, you know, you kind of have the inside of how cinemas work. How far in advance yes. do you know a movie is going to be playing for? Like, do you know that when a movie releases, you've got the next two weeks of screening set do it does it does a company pay for you know oh we want to have it in theaters for four weeks because my my other thought mm -hmm. is why doesn't netflix release it in cinemas and if it flops then pull it out of cinemas and throw it up on netflix well you couldn't really do that with the the big films um like especially the big companies who have a hold over over the cinemas especially screens which is mainly just disney uh, mm. when it comes down to it, they uh, want a certain amount of, of uh, screens. They want a certain amount of, of showings that they are promised. So it takes over even if the film is not doing as well. Um, that, but that's not really answering so you, your question. You've still, got to, you've still got to show it because they've said we need this X amount. But surely, yeah. surely what they could also do is say, hey, look, we're going to have a two-week run of this. Yeah. If, it, if it's successful and it's still making a decent amount, you know, let's say it's, Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's dropped 50% after the first week, or maybe it's, you know, dropped even a bit less. Let's keep it running. But if it's dropped, you know, 60, 70, 80% of audiences are no longer seeing this movie two weeks later, let's pull it out, throw it up on Netflix. Surely that would be Which, a by better... the way, for, for blockbusters, yeah, is normal uh, that you have a 70% mm. drop. It's, it's really rare that it goes, uh, that it's like less than 50 because um, but, Avatar, just to get back on Avatar just for like two seconds, yeah. that's about to hit a billion dollars worldwide. Yeah. And it did it with not the hugest box uh, office yeah. opening, but it, uh, like, like we expected, has really steady legs and uh, just keeps on growing. And it's got to be in theaters for at least another six weeks at least I'd oh for say. sure I and assume. it's not going to be on netflix for uh, not, not, uh, disney it's never going to be on netflix but it's not going to be on disney plus for at least another like five six yeah. months they, they're going to keep it out of there and they're going to try to have it in cinemas for as long as possible and then they're going to be yeah. like hey look it's on disney plus come and experience it in 
IMAX in hand. Which I, I guess, you know, Glass Onion, I feel like it's great as a collective theater experience, not a big screen theater experience. Yeah. And, and lastly, yeah. I guess the decisions for, uh, I wanted to tack it on, for theaters are usually made on the Monday of the next week and they decided from Thursday on to next Wednesday. Sure. At least that's how it works in Switzerland. So you could change times and usually, yeah. especially the big theater chains, announce it on, on Monday or Tuesday. So there, there is an adjustment period that you can have. Yeah. And it's usually just fixed in one week in advance, but you usually plan about two weeks ahead. Uh, but that's that's all of the insider stuff that I got. Welcome. We spent so much time not getting into the specifics of Knives Out. Yes. Hopefully Sorry. this was some interesting... Well, we got some interesting insights in this that maybe some other people don't, but let's get into us for a discussion of Glass Onion. Talk about that mystery, you know, the, the big Glass Onion at the center of it. It seems like it's layered, but it's actually just see-through when you look closely at it. A theme that runs through the whole movie that uh, I gotta say, I called out pretty early and was like, oh, I feel like it's him. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I felt really smart <laughs> when it got yeah. revealed. But uh, how did you experience uh, the film? Uh, look, to, to get to the mystery of it all, I kind of called it early on as well. I thought, oh, yep, I know who it's going to be. And then it tries to spin it one direction and then it brings you back and you go, there you are. Harry uh, Styles. So <laughs> it's, 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 yes, Harry Styles is the murderer <laughs> in this. I was waiting for yeah. you to pop you up. You said there. one direction. I'm sorry. One direction. Yeah, no, look, so story wise, story wise, uh, there's a there's a number of plot points that I absolutely adored. And and because Ryan Johnson is obviously trying to make you guess the mystery as well, there's been this resurgence in yeah. murder mysteries recently. Uh I've been trying to, you know, look at every single detail. So when they, you know, pull focus mm -hmm. on something or you kind of notice something in the background, I'm just trying to see what he's hinting at. So and Yeah. I guess my favorite part of this film is is the editing, the 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 way the mm -hmm. story is put together. Because you'll go back to a scene that you saw thirty minutes ago, and you'll get an extra little bit in it, and then you'll go and continue on, and then you'll go back to that scene again and get an extra layer on top of that. So I guess that's my my favorite part of this is that Ryan Johnson has pretty much gotten a story, written it from A to B. That's the story, A to B, or let's say A to C, and he's basically then cut it up into multiple different moments and just taken parts yeah. out that he can then feed to you later on and then you get the whole picture and that is yeah. the best part i kind of want him to be in the reflection as like some of them are fighting and he has a spielberg <laughs> moment because yeah. it feels like, like yes i got the power of editing and how i yeah. framed this how i portrayed um, him but no yeah i i really enjoyed this story a, a lot more than i enjoyed knives out i i did enjoy as I said, and I did enjoy Knives Out, but my my issue was just the who done it was revealed, you know, too soon. They should have kept it a little bit longer. But yeah. this one here, they obviously keep bringing it back, and it's not revealed as soon, but it's still enough for you to kind of go, I think I know who it is, and you keep guessing and guessing and guessing. And this movie is a, a tad bit longer than the original, only about eight minutes though, so not that much. I feel like it takes way longer to get going though. I don't know how you feel about the opening, but I actually hated it <laughs> i thought it was really bad uh and uh no what did, what did you make of it because like the split screens and character introductions and all that just didn't really work for me and as a through line as well i don't buy those people as friends they just don't really make sense because they're supposed to be like it makes sense that they are connected through uh miles but they're not he's like one that joins later and they're supposed to be a friend group and i just i just don't really see it but uh, yeah, what the, do you think of that? So to, to start with the opening, I, I totally get it. It's quite long. I think it's, you know, 10 minutes of box opening montage, which is quite boring. Yes. If I'm totally <laughs> honest, but it's an introduction to these characters, which you obviously have a large range of characters you're trying to introduce that are all part of the story. Uh, because honestly, like honestly, from the moment you see uh, Blanc in the tub, I was hooked because it was uh, yeah. <laughs> him in a tub smoking a cigar, playing, uh, what's that Among game us. called? Uh, Among Us. And, yeah. you know, FaceTiming a bunch of uh, more cameos, uh, which was <laughs> Natasha Leo and um, Stephen Sondheim, rest oh, in God. peace. Crazy. Yeah, a bunch of them. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So that that from there was where I was hooked in. I have to admit that the box part was a bit weird and it didn't yeah. really come back to be anything too crazy. I thought, oh, okay, maybe we should keep an idea of what's, maybe it's going to play out like these little, little quizzes and little, you know, puzzles they have to solve are going to just be the bigger puzzles they meet later on. And it's not, yeah. it's just, you know, this big old elaborate, they try to work it out to then lead up to the joke, mm. which was obviously Andy breaking the, or not, not Andy, yeah. but Andy breaking the box, which was the big setup yeah. of the joke. I did find that quite funny that, you know, breaking the box, I thought that was a good joke, but the, the moment of them solving it was quite long and tedious, but either way, it's, it's basically from the moment that you see Blanc in the tub and leading on uh from there is where i started really enjoying the film so i do agree opening sucks what was the other thing you said the editing i guess with the split screen i didn't really say much no i hated it that. i hated it don't do it was that. a bit tacky to stop me. it yeah it was a uh, like i don't know i thought i was in a um, steven soderbergh film where it's like i'm experimenting with something i don't know if it's going to work and spoiler alert it doesn't really work yeah uh well speaking of those Let's talk about the cameos first before we talk about the rest of the performances. Maybe that's a bit loosely connected, but uh, I thought it was a very pleasant surprise to see Hugh Grant just open the door. It's like, oh, that's <laughs> that makes sense. They're <laughs> gay. <laughs> <Okay. Yeah. laughs> They're gay. <laughs> Here it is. What was really random was at the pier. It was just Ethan Hawke. I don't really get why Ethan Hawke was in this. I don't know what Ryan Johnson is trying to do. It's like everyone who's in this film needs to be like some notable, noteworthy person or why is it so random like There's... the serena williams film also feels like a bit of a flex like oh yeah she's just there but i guess it's like understating i don't know the simple mindedness mindedness of, of a bil billionaire who just doesn't care uh there's a, a lot of very funny cameos in this and i guess that's, that's it's exciting to have directors who can get some big a-listers in just for little moments um yeah you know if you think about some of the greatest cameos of all time, they've literally been short little things. The 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 mm. best one for me I always think about is obviously Brad Pitt and Deadpool. Uh for the literally like the, the twelve yeah. frames or whatever he's in it. That's that's one of the best cameos you can ever think of. But to have people like uh Ethan Hawke and you've got Hugh Grant in here as um little cameos for like just brief moments and they're very funny characters at the same time. That's great. Yeah. But then you've got cameos such as the dong sound being Joseph <laughs> Gordon Levitt as. Yeah. A he was cameo. also in the original knife sound, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Apparently, there's just <laughs> there's just this thing where Joseph Gordon Levitt is cameoed in every single one of his films, uh, which is great. This is going to be even more exciting. It's going to be fun to have the, to figure out where he's going to be in the next one. But yeah. I really enjoy these directors who can the get great mystery. ensemble casts um yeah. because obviously you, you've got a range of directors that can do that you you'll have a tarantino movie that has a broad range of actors but they don't feel like cameos they all feel like they're fleshed out characters it's the same with yeah. someone like wes anderson where he's got massive ensemble casts but they are the characters where in this you'll watch it and you'll go that's just ethan hawk spraying a gun into mm -hmm. people's mouths or that's just hugh grant who is in love with uh, Blanc's, uh, well, in love with Blanc. Like, that, that's all it is, right? That's just, it's a cameo, and that's the fun part of it. And I wouldn't feel like, I don't feel like the cameos would work if they were playing a more intense character, a more realistic mm -hmm. character. It's the fact that this is a fun film, and it's a fun cameo. That's the best part of it. Yeah. Cameo is all done. I feel like they are quite enjoyable. Let's get to the performances. We got a stacked cast. Let's kick it off with Daniel Craig because I feel like it's, it's so apparent that he's having so much fun with this character. He has some outstanding moments, um, especially towards the end of the film. Uh, it had me like uh, chuckling as well because I was like, I was trying like not to like just laugh at some stupid joke, but he's just like his perplexity of... Um, you know, the, the reveal of the killer, uh, that the mice is just dead dumb. It was, uh, mm. <laughs> it was so funny. It was very funny. Daniel Craig has, it, like, he was my favorite part of Knives Out, the first one. That was probably my, like, yeah. my favorite part of that. I will watch every single one of these movies just for him because it's such a fun character to have him doing that mm -hmm. real 
fun accents and it's you know you know him as 007 for pretty much majority of his acting career as this suave british spy to then be a southern uh detective who can be quite over the top at times and you can see that he's really enjoying this this performance and yeah i'll yeah. continue to praise daniel craig for this because i absolutely love him in this role what are some other standouts in the cast that uh yeah um i will always say i want to get into this i don't think i'll get into this topic today if i'm totally honest i don't think it's fair but uh, dave batista is my favorite wrestler gone actor person ever um, i'll second that yeah i i, I he's, obviously he's great yeah there's a couple of I mean, the big three would be Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Dave Bautista, and John Cena. And while yeah. I feel like The Rock has been doing it for ages, The Rock has just become The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. That's all he really is. He's become sort of like a Jeff Goldblum type character. John Cena has been doing, I guess, action-y roles. And I can yeah. see him being sort of like a modern day action star where he just does action roles but dave batista is just doing a bit of everything like he's in the mcu he's in a murder mystery he's in you know blade runner 2049 that's where i really went okay dave batista could possibly just be you know i i I won't even consider him a wrestler i'll consider him an actor when i watched him in 2049 so i have to admit that dave batista is one of the best actors working right now who started off with wrestling that's just a great shock um because he will play these big buff dudes and he can still get quite emotional and he can still give a good range of emotions so i have to admit dave batista did an excellent job other than that i wouldn't say that anyone else really jumps out at me uh edward norton as much as i was really hoping he would do something cool it's just edward norton being edward (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's just like his manic just craziness yeah, he's really good yeah, at portraying yeah. that and like with the eyes when you see him for the first time on the island it's just like a lot of that uh and then i i don't know janelle Monet as like the second I, part of her yes, character no yes i will admit did I, that work I, for you i enjoyed her uh janelle Monet's yeah. uh, performance especially as a twin is is quite exciting as a twist because she's playing two characters but yeah like overall like she can just once you have her and daniel craig working together they were bouncing off each other quite well and that was the that was quite fun it comes a heist movie in Um, a sense it does it does right at the end right um yeah yeah she does she's probably also a standout but other than that i don't think there was anyone that was too yeah yeah that's what i that's what i came here to see um because it was just so many performances there's so many actors so many characters and cameos that you just get overwhelmed but the core yeah you know two three four people the core, the at least the core ensemble was quite good no one really outshines someone else they all are quite good with what they do and i feel like that's intentional because at the end of the day the mystery builds it might be misleading but it builds to something where none of them are actually really relevant to the story they're just like a tag along to miles and they're tag along to the story as well like I was quite disappointed to not really see more of uh, why they don't like uh, Miles, and it was it was obvious in parts, but I just wanted more than just like the clip notes version of well, that's why they don't like them because he's a dick. I just wanted more in that relationship to really mm. buy that one of them is the actual killer. Uh, and um, I thought that Madeline Klein uh, whiskey. <laughs> It's a really fun addition because she also gets a bit more to do in the second part of it where we get to hear a bit more why she's tagging along to uh, to Duke Cody, uh, the, the mama's boy who is like teaching about masculinity online. Uh, it's <laughs> I guess like that ties me over because he's, he's a, the biggest Twitch streamer or whatever, uh, where there's a disconnectedness where Ryan Johnson, I guess, doesn't he's just too old i don't know if the it it doesn't feel like factual or make sense in any sort of way which is fine it doesn't have to um but to me that's overall kind of the case with the comedy humor is for me like almost a 60 40 at times it's really low maybe a 70 30 uh but um didn't really work for me uh, at all times and he's just he does this really topical and current humor where he really wants to capture the zeitgeist of the moment with I, like the Among Us is maybe 
something you can pinpoint to, but I just meant overall of uh, the characters that he has on screen. And it doesn't always work for me because they're obviously like just caricatures of people. The superlative, which is fine, didn't really click with me. But uh, what did you what did you think of the humor? Did it work for you? Among Us is the Fortnite in Endgame. Yeah, and I was thinking that, but a, I didn't say it. Yeah, it's exactly. It's such a topical yeah. moment that that joke would have landed if this film came out two years ago. In 2020, ago. yeah. So yeah. these kind of, that kind of humor doesn't And land. if Stephen Sondheim was still alive, he's and, dead, but <laughs> he's dead now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you, legend. You, I, I agree with the humor kind of thing because a good chunk yeah. of this humor is this sort of, let's make fun of sort of the internet culture. Yeah. Uh, Ness that's currently happening that's not funny like to most people that's not going to be quite funny to a certain small yeah. group of people that's going to be funny but i feel like for the majority of people this sort of play on you know toxic masculinity online on a streaming service it, it's not a funny thing it's just a because caricature. it's real it's pretty it, real i mean you know? it's a true thing uh, but i yeah. just don't think it's a yeah. i don't think it's a, like a this is a funny kind of thing. I mean, there's definitely an no. angle you can work on it and it is funny, but in this moment, it just kind of feels like a, a slightly older guy poking a stick at something and going, ah, make it laugh, make them laugh. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I agree with the whole like 60, 40, 70, 30, it lands kind of thing where most of it doesn't land for that kind of jokes. But for me, it makes up for it with these fun, dumb cameos. So if they're going to obviously continue on, because, you know, Netflix might just say, nah, fuck it, we're not going to do another one. Uh, I would like less of this, let's poke fun at the internet, and more of this, hey, let's have a bunch of cameos in this whodunit mystery, because that's what they've come in there for. That's what they're here to see. That's what an audience wants to watch, a whodunit. They're not here to look at themselves and the internet yeah. and go, oh my God, the internet and the world's fucked. You know what I'd like to see for the third Knife Out sequel? Uh, I would like to hire Benoit Blanc to figure out why the fuck they cancelled Mindhunter. Uh, <laughs> Maybe someone can tell me. Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Let's do an internal investigation. I'm surprised there wasn't Netflix. a Netflix cameo either. Oh, did, uh, isn't there? No, I don't know. They, they usually work it in. Um, I saw one with. I mean, like, Jeremy Disney Renner's. Plus recently. Uh, was... What is it? Jeremy, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Renner's hot sauce and Jared Leto's kombucha yeah. were very two funny jokes. I found those yeah. very funny because they were cameos <laughs> with a joke like sprinkled on top. I thought that was probably the two yeah. best jokes that landed. Um, and also, the yeah, fact the that Pierre one as well. Hugh, Hugh Grant and Benoit Blanca together yeah i guess that's pretty obvious if you i have a hair guy <laughs> together i also wanted to bring up the art direction the well, <laughs> art direction naming it by the category for the oscars just uh, i i guess the set decoration and all of that um because Phenomenal. it is quite extravagant to have that um that house that island and Phenomenal. it was a couple of days i don't know if it was a promotional thing but um the the villa was uh, like or the place was listed uh, on Zillow for I don't know how much it was so much money to actually get that place. So there is I guess I I never looked this up. There is I guess a physical location for this whole thing, or I I have no clue. Uh, did you did you do an investigation there? I'm doing a live one right now. Oh my god! Oh, it's a real place, Villa Twenty. Oh my god, it's oh my god, it's gorgeous. There how is much no is glass hanging on the top. Um. Ah. Uh. Well, they blew it up. <laughs> they blew the whole thing up. It's like, ah, how's their uh, house? Didn't they blow it up? I will, I but I guess Ryan Johnson is not no, a Nolan. It's definitely not going to be cheap. Yeah, how much is it? Can we, can we afford it? To, I don't think, uh, I don't there think there's a... It, no? It's only going to let me inquire, but it's... Right. Like, like a good 80% of what you see in that. In, in that, it, the only thing that looks like it's going to be CG is going to be the two glass balls at the top. Right. All the do rest I, do of I get the real. car? Uh, car goes ah disappointing but yeah that's that i i feel like it's uh well i guess then that is digital that part of it i loved it i thought the staging was great to have like this i also rich think place the costumes and... are wicked as well yeah blanc's outfits are just awesome throughout the entire thing and dave batista's muscles look so realistic <laughs> yeah he's in the body suit suit if you haven't watched any um wrestling he's actually He's he's not he's actually like the Chris Evans version of 
<laughs> like some little man. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, I also like the the introduction there where they have like the the art pieces. I saw like someone point out that like one really famous painting where it's just like red and blue or something like that. It's just uh, he also hung it up upside down. There's mm. like a lot of a, a lot of these little side gags in the background. If I guess you you know a bit of art, then you're like, oh, this is like. I feel like Ryan Johnson has that hidden in a lot of places and in the in more obvious ways you, you got the cameos of like oh i know that person and it's a joke he's here and then he's gone but then also just in the plot as well where like uh he's he's pretty good at tying things back together where it feels like it's it's paid off in a later sense which is why i feel like i fe like i felt it was very predictable where uh, it would end up ultimately with the killer but i still uh, enjoyed my journey there like the the thing of turning off the lights you know and then something happens it was okay that's coming back later at some point and it's probably going to be uh, probably going to be pretty fun and mm -hmm. it did uh so what do you think of the the actual kills or the attempted kills that are blocked by <laughs> whatever handbook you got in there by your weak ass gun that can't even I guess sh shoot through a book some of the some of the kills are fake some of the kills are real it's I yeah. don't think any of them stand out like a horror movie, so I really don't have a comment right. on this at all. It was it was sad to see Dave Bautista go. To be honest, I was like, no, he's not going to be in the rest True. of the film. And then he kind of gets to be through the flashbacks. Yeah, I, I feel like it it has that through line of them being loyal to Miles for such a long time, and it tries to be this bigger moment at the end where they stand up to him. I didn't really feel that and that's also part a point of it to me that makes it honestly better than like a big old grand moment where they all stand but it's like i am spartacus like that's a type of sense because it's still underwhelming because someone's still dead and it doesn't ultimately change that much for uh for him as a whole because he's still fucking rich you know <laughs> he's not yeah. getting all of that away i think that wraps it up for our review let us know what uh you thought of glass onion if you were streaming it in the comfort of your own home or if you did go out to uh the theater in the very limited one week run to go check it out uh, I i'd be interested to hear some different experiences you know does it does it hit as much if you just watch it alone by yourself just crumbled up in your bathtub playing Among Us on your side monitor. But Lachlan, uh, where do you arrive at as a rating for Glass Onion? Uh, I had a good time. Enough that I didn't hate all of the dumb jokes that were made about the internet and millennials. Uh, that kind of could really bring down the, the score for me. But I landed on a three out of five stars on Letterboxd. Walden, we agree on that. Uh, I'm also at a three out of five. Uh, like I said this, at the start of the review, uh, to me, these two films are pretty much equal in fun uh, and quality as well. So a quite enjoyable ride to go on over the holidays and into the new year. I'm really interested to see the numbers as well for this. Uh, with the watch time, if this is... Because the first one was huge. So to see... If this is an increase in subscribers, uh, I guess we'd have to wait a bit longer until we get the next quarterly report from Netflix and just see the the amount of watch time hours. Um, so I'll I'll be interested in that because, uh, like you said, Lachlan, it's I think it's pretty much guaranteed that we get a third one. Uh, yeah. But I can see them doing this for a while until Daniel Craig is again talking about the knives out sets uh, like he did with James Bond that he wants to get out yeah. of it. Um, but that's that. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's show. Uh, next up in the main episode of the podcast, uh, we are doing our top uh, 2022 films, our top 10s. We are currently very busy to catch up with all that is still so many uh, movies. relevant. There's just too many of them. So join on in on that conversation and maybe get your top 10 lists ready to share with us. In, in, in Well, I guess in those comments, you're really really prepared commenters <laughs> at that point <laughs> if you stayed all the way through to this review but you can find uh luckily and me on all of our socials those are linked below as well as a link tree for everything quiet on set and uh yeah that's pretty much it thanks so much for uh joining us in our review uh hope you had a good time at the movies and we'll see you soon Welcome back to the Quiet On Set podcast powered by Cinnamon. I'm Ewan Graf, joined by Lachlan Teeley. And today we are... Wait, sorry. I'm taking away. You wanted to do a... You want to uh, do my part as well? Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, no, I just... 
That's no, like this the is the intro re- now. This is the intro rating. now. This no. is this is serious. No, 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 no. This is what happens, everybody. Ewan takes over <laughs> the intro. I take over. And I don't get anything. He, he's going to do the entire podcast himself. I'm turning into Miles. I'm just taking credit for what's not mine. <laughs> In the theme of today's episode, we are taking a look at the sequel uh, of Knives Out from Ryan Johnson. Oh my God, you seriously uh, are taking this as the intro. Cast. We're not actually going to yes, cut this. No. Oh, you motherfucker. Are- <laughs> I had a whole thing written. <laughs> <laughs> no, we could redo it, but that's a good outro <laughs> clip, uh, like an extra clip. 